Mm-hmm. I understand. Yes. Okay. So maybe we start now. So uh, yes. Francesco, uh, Professor Di Virgilio, it is a great pleasure that you always to talk to you. Nah? And I would like very much to meet you in person, yes, as we have done before, now, at various occasions now in Brazil, now, in Italy, and in in uh, Japan and in Germany, yes. Mm-hmm. So um, um, I would like to present you a little bit. Yes, so Professor um, Francesco Di, Di Virgilio, he is a professor of clinical pathology at the Department of Morpho- Morphology, Surgery, and Experimental Medicine of the University of Italy. And he has been the deputy deputy director for research. He has been the dean of education, department chairman, and many honors have been given to him. And he is a current member of the European Academy of Tumor um, Immunology, and he is a member of the faculty of 1000 in the section of cell biology. Professor Di Virgilio is um, so the most prominent researcher on the P2X7 receptor, yes. And he has, uh, uh, he has defined novel paradigms. For example, uh, but the P2X7 receptor is not only a c- cell killer, uh, he has established uh, the paper of the P2X7 receptor in cancer cell that is, may promote, for example, proliferation. Yes? And uh, Professor Di Virgilio, and I'm side working on very, very active in tumor biology, uh, um, he has um, the f- fields of investigation such as inflammation, neuroinflammation, cytokines, inflammasome, where the P2X7 receptor has shown to be very important, innate immunity, energy metabolism. So what would be, for example, the connection with the P2X7 receptor to the mitochondria? Yeah? And um, Professor Di Virgilio has published, uh, so I looked this up today, it's, uh, 370 papers, yeah? 25,000 citations in Web of Science and an incredible age factor of 88. Né? So showing that so his, his, his uh, outstanding action in the field of, of poinergic signaling. And beside of this, so Professor Di Virgilio is a very uh, gentle person, very nice person, yes? And uh, and he is willing to share his experience with uh, with all students and researchers, uh, and you are always very welcome at our congresses, which we organize in Brazil by the Brazilian Purim Club. Yes, and today uh, we will listen to a very special lecture of Professor Francesco. Uh, give it will be. Purinergic signaling, a window of opportunity for the therapy of COVID-19. So a show uh, that purinergic signaling is also here, a very important field. So thank you, Francesco, to be willing to give today uh, the closing lecture of this seminar series. Thank you very much. Thank you, Henning. Uh, I must say, um, I must say that the greatest honor to me is not all the many things that uh, very kindly Henning told about me, but the greatest honor is to have the friendship and the esteem of my Brazilian colleagues. This is the, this is the most important thing. Yes, and, uh, but you certainly this, have, yes. These times, it is so difficult, so rare to have good, sincere friends that we must try to keep our friends 
close to us by all means. And uh, I'm, um, I'm proud of your esteem and uh, your friendship. Of course, I did not deserve all the beautiful things that Henning said. He has been by far too kind. No, but it's not. It's not. I thank you very much for, for all these very, very kind words. So um, I will start. Uh, first of all, I, I shift to another department, Henning. Now I am at the Department of Medical Sciences. I don't know if you see it in the in the uh, yes, in the yes, first slide. I see, yes. <laughs> but this this has been very recent. Therefore, you, you it, it 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 was impossible that you were uh, aware of of this shift. Okay. And um, what I will try to tell you today is what we know about. Uh, uh, the possible interactions between the pure energic system, uh, notably P2X7 and, uh, and uh, coronavirus disease. Uh, first of all, well, uh, we know very little, also because there is almost no literature about P2X7 and, uh, and, uh, and uh, COVID. I checked the medline a, a few minutes ago and there are only six papers uh, about P2X7 and COVID. So there is a lot of room for investigation. First of all, a few words about COVID. I know that you know everything about COVID, at least everything that it is possible to know these days, but just for the few people that uh, are not fully aware of this disease. Uh, you know that the pandemic started probably in China in November, December uh, 2019. However, and this is very recent news, there is uh, clear evidence that in Italy, the virus was present already in November uh, 2019 and maybe October 2019. And there is the suspicion that even in August, September 2019, there was people already infected with the virus. Therefore, the question is, where did the virus came from? At least, where did the virus come to Italy? By which routes? Uh, you know that the causative agent is the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is a beta coronavirus. And uh, the estimates is that about 81% of infected people will have my disease, 14% severe and 5% critical disease. And the death rate, uh, it is about 2 to 3%, although during this second pandemia, at least in Italy, the death rate might be higher. Uh, it is usually... Uh, uh, subdivided into three stages, a first stage, second stage, and third stage. During the first stage of progression, patients experience fever, mild dyspnea, tachypnea, mild reduction of, arter of arterial oxygen saturation, less than 92%, and a ratio between the oxygen the arterial pressure and the fraction of oxygen in the inhaled air of less, of, of less than 300 millimeters mercury. Um, when this ratio is below 400 millimeter mercury, means that uh, uh, there is some problem in uh, uh, arterial blood oxygenation. And this problem is due to the, uh, to the diffusion of oxygen through the lung epithelium. Then there is a second stage, which is characterized by respiratory failure that will require mechanical ventilation. I put this acronym ARDS in brackets. This acronym means acute respiratory distress syndrome. 
I will uh, get back to this later on. Uh, during the second stage, there might also be uh, the beginning of this very serious um, lung uh, disease, which is called acute respiratory disease. Um, 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 Oh my God, uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome. But as I said, I will get back to this later on. And also during the second stage, also shock may develop. And as a consequence of a shock, multiple organ failure might also develop. Then the third stage, which is the most serious, which is characterized by systemic hyperinflammation by a, a a progressive coagulopathy and a full-blown ARDS-like syndrome. This third stage might also be paralleled by cardiac damage and again shock and multi-organ failure. This is the disease progression. Presentation at the beginning, the disease may start with fever, with dry cough, with rhinorrhea, headache, fatigue, diarrhea, odino, uh, odinophagia. Odinophagia is pain when you eat. And then uh, anosmia, anosmia you cannot smell. And uh, uh, ageusia, ageusia means that you cannot taste food. And the lingering effects, which can be very serious, are fatigue, of course, and uh, uh, more, most dreadful uh, chronic respiratory failure. Thus, the progression of the disease uh, might be uh, summarized in the mild, moderate cases. After the initial exposure, there are some uh, symptoms which might be related to the GI tract. Then, uh, uh, this may lead to mild pulmonary infection. And in these cases, the, if the patients uh, recover, there will be resolution within, let's say, three to four weeks. During this phase, it is understood that uh, the protective immune response will uh, be very good. The uh, inflammation innate immunity-based inflammation and thrombosis will be very mild, and therefore this will lead to seroconversion, T-cell activation, and clearance of the virus. Uh, in these cases, there will be, as I said, minimal inflammation, minimal coagulopathy, and very little uh, damage to um, tissues and apparatuses. Okay, but this is only in the mild, moderate cases. In the severe cases, the disease over these three to four week times will, uh, will um, increase steadily, will worsen steadily, and after pulmonary infection, there will be also the diffusion of the virus or the diffusion of the inflammation to multiple organs, to multiple sites. It is understood that uh, these progressive phases of uh, uh, di disease dissemination is due to a failure of the protective immune response that will be unable to clear the virus and this will be followed by a very strong uh, inflammation and a very strong coagulopathy. This will lead to serious inflammation and injury in the, in the lungs. This will start the famous cytokine storm, which will be responsible also for ARDS and for the systemic effects. During this uncontrolled phase of disease dissemination, there will be a progressive activation of uh, the coagulation system. 
the progressive activation of the coagulation system will lead to diffuse thrombosis in the lung and also systemic thrombosis. And this uh, may lead to the, to the patient demise. Thus, uh, to summarize what I've just said, it seems that after the early phases of uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, for reasons that are not known, the initial protective immune response is subverted by violent inflammatory response. We may call this uh, violent inflammatory response hyperinflammation, characterized by overactivation of innate immune cells and uncontrolled cytokine release. Hyperinflammation will be paralleled and according to many triggered by activation of coagulation with a thrombotic diathesis. This association of uh, uncontrolled hyperinflammation and thrombosis may also be referred to as uh, thromboinflammation. So the problem is uh, why and how is hyperinflammation started? Because there is something that uh, all people now working uh, in COVID, all people working with the patients in COVID, they are uh, now convinced that uh, the real issue is to uh, control inflammation. The real issue is to find the means to stop, to revert this uncontrolled high inflammation. And therefore, we should know why and how is hyperinflammation start. We may address this issue from a purinergic perspective. For example, we may think according to the picture of a simplified sequence of events involved in the pathogenesis of COVID-19 from a purinergic perspective. According to this purinergic perspective, uh, maybe this is better, According to this purinergic perspective, the virus will activate the known receptor, an angiotensin converting enzyme receptor. This will lead to a subversion of uh, uh, angiotensin homeostasis that will affect a number of systems, will uh, trigger inflammation, will cause cell death, will cause endothelitis, will uh, activate angiogenesis, will injury the lung epithelia, will cause fibrosis. Anyway, this uh, subversion of the angiotensin system will cause cell damage. Cell damage might well cause an accumulation of ATP or ADP in the inter in the inter into the interstitial space Accumulation of ATP, ADP into the interstitial space will cause platelet activation and platelet activation will activate the coagulation system. We don't need to concentrate on this flow chart. The important thing is that according to this view, the accumulation of ATP and possibly ADP into the interstitial space during the initial phases of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, will uh, uh, generate a, a strong pro-inflammatory environment. And this, pro, uh, this strong pro-inflammatory environment will dictate the evolution of the, of the disease. But then the question arises, if uh, uh, we uh, assume that there is uh, ATP accumulation in COVID-19. Can we measure ATP release in this disease? Do we have any hints that uh, ATP in fact accumulates in the tissues during COVID-19? Uh, to answer this question, we go must go back to a few experiments. Um, experiments, for example, that uh, uh, I did some time ago together with uh, Marco Itzko, whom you may know. In this experiment, what uh, Marco did was to look at the ATP concentration in the bronchoalveolar lavage fluid from 
patients that uh, uh, were affected by ARDS. In those times, 2018, there was no notion of COVID-19, but the pneumonia caused by ARDS is very similar to the pneumonia caused by COVID-19. COVID Therefore, we may assume that the pathophysiological picture that we detect in ARDS may be similar or suggestive of the picture that we see in COVID-19. Anyway, so going back to these experiments, measurements, uh, measurement of ATP concentration in uh, bronchoalveolar lavage fluid, we can see that uh, in the ARDS patients, there is a so substantial and significant accumulation of ATP in the bron bronchoalveolar lavage fluid. In uh, patients affected by pneumonia, there is less, and in the controls, of course, there is very little. Therefore, it seems that in patients affected by ARS, there is indeed ATP accumulation in the lungs. This also happens in another condition related to COVID. In uh, 2010, this is a paper by Isabel Coulain, uh, in 2010, uh, of course, again, we had not the slightest idea of what COVID-19 might be, but uh, in those times, there was, of course, interstitial pulmonary fibrosis, IPF. Interstitial pulmonary fibrosis is a very serious uh, pulmonary disease which leads to a, a very serious uh, disability and, 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 uh, and to death. Uh, keep in mind this because, uh, as, I mentioned be, as I mentioned before, a uh, frequent complication of uh, COVID-19 is lung fibrosis. Okay, let's go back to these experiments. Uh, these investigators measured the ATP concentration in the bronchoalveolar lavage fluid from patients affected by IPF, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And you can see here that there is a clear accumulation of ATP in the lungs of these patients. Then we go to a, an, an animal model. Mouse do not, uh, mouse, um, uh, sorry, mice are not affected by ARDS, but there is a mouse model for ARDS which is ALI. ALI stands for acute lung injury. You can induce acute lung injury in the mouse model by uh, lipopolysaccharide inhalation. Lipopolysaccharide causes a very strong uh, activation of the innate immune cells of the lung and uh, therefore a very strong inflammation. In the bulk fluid from these mice, there is again a clear accumulation of uh, ATP. Even more interestingly and nicely, if you allow me, you can show that there is ATP accumulation in the lungs of these mice by using the probe, the plasma membrane luciferase, which you may remember that we developed in our lab. And uh, you can engineer with the plasma membrane luciferase hex cells, and you can use these hex cells as reporters of the ATP concentration in the lungs. How you do this? Simply by intratracheal injection of the Pimeluc engineered hex cells. So by uh, using this trick, you can show by uh, bioluminescence that there is indeed ATP accumulation in the lungs of the mice treated with, with LPS on the right, but not in the lungs of the mice, uh, which were not treated with, with LPS, but uh, treated with uh, uh, um, uh, sterile saliva. So also in, the, in the acute lung injury, there is ATP accumulation into the lung tissue. So there is uh, another exp uh, experimental system that again with uh, Marco Itzko. You may ask why I did all these experiments with Marco Itzko. The, the answer is very simple. Marco Itzko is a, a pneumologist, 
a lung physician. Therefore, he knows a lot about lung uh, physiology. There is another system by which you can induce uh, fibrosis in the, in the lungs. And this is the, in, the, the inhalation of bleomycin. Uh, in uh, bleomycin treated mice, again, you have an accumulation of extracellular ATP. Uh, this is the mice before being killed and opened. These are the mice after being killed and opened. And, the, and you can see here that uh, there is very strong luminescence, while in the mouse treated with uh, uh, phosphate buffer saline, there is no luminescence. Therefore, uh, we can conclude that uh, uh, in the that in COVID there might be accumulation of uh, ATP in the lungs. But even more in interestingly, ATP is also released into the lungs during ventilation. This is uh, an old paper by Rick Boucher. Uh, you may uh, recall Rick Boucher. Rick Boucher was a colleague of ours, very active in pure energy research. Uh, some time ago uh, in uh, Chapel Hill. Rick, B Rick Boucher was the one who more thoroughly investigated the role of P2Y receptors in lung physiology. In this paper, uh, uh, Rick and his colleagues show that ATP is released during mechanical ventilation, during heavy mechanical ventilation, uh, ventilation into the lungs and contributes to lung edema. Why is this, re why is this relevant? Uh, in the uh, picture on the lower right, you can see a schematic representation of a ventilation apparatus. This is the standard procedure to which COVID patients are subjected in the intensive care units. This is the standard uh, uh, care, the standard supportive therapy for all critically ill COVID patients. Therefore, in the previous slides, we learned that uh, COVID inf uh, coronavirus infection causes ATP accumulation into the lung tissue. We learned that uh, uh, lung fibrosis is accompanied by ATP accumulation into the interstitial lung tissue. Now we learn that one of the most important therapies for COVID patients is a main cause of ATP accumulation into the lung tissues. So a number of uh, maneuvers in uh, these patients and a number of uh, agents lead to ATP accumulation into the lung. Interestingly, if ATP is, as we know, a strong pro-inflammatory agent, you know very well that adenosine is an anti-inflammatory um, anti agent. I, I wish to bring to your attention briefly this paper by, my, uh, by Misha Sitkowski. You know Misha Sitkowski. Misha is another very dear friend of ours who has developed a very important research in the adenosine field. He recently published a paper to, 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 together with some friends from Italy, in which he shows that administration of adenosine during uh, mechanical ventilation decreases the death rate of uh, COVID patients exposed to mechanical ventilation. And uh, how does adenosine do this? simply by inhibiting the A2A adenosine receptors in the lungs, and therefore by suppressing, suppressing inflammation into the lungs. So uh, for us, who are, uh, and we are uh, purinergic uh, aficionados, we have one side of the coin ATP, very strong pro-inflammatory molecule, and the other side of the coin adenosine, very strong anti-inflammatory molecule. Both agents might be very important for COVID patients. Then uh, we can conclude that ATP is released into lung tissue during ARS-like ARS inflammation, ventilation, and fibrosis. 
events that are known to occur in COVID-19 patients. So if ATP accumulates in the interstitial space, what does ATP and maybe ADP as well, what these nucleotides do in COVID-19? Uh, I told you that in COVID-19, we have two very uh, dreadful events that develop hyperinflammation, hypercoagulation that converge in thromboinflammation. How is ATP related to these events? Well, we can think that ATP and possibly ADP on one hand have a direct effect on lung cells causing alveolar macrophage activation, cell death, endothelial cell activation, promotion of angiogenesis, lung epithelial damage, and therefore nerves like syndrome and fibrosis. And on the other hand, they act on the coagulation system causing platelet activation, stimulation of thrombotic pathways, stimulation of platelet adhesion, secretion of platelet activating factor, tissue factor, this is very, very important, thromboxane and other procoagulant factors. So is there any role for P2 receptors in uh, all these phenomena, in, in all these events, in uh, COVID-associated th thromboinflammation? It is believed that uh, uh, six P2 receptors are putatively involved in the pathogenesis of COVID-19. The P2Y1, the P2Y12, P2X1, and this mainly in the coagulation arm of, uh, of, of uh, uh, COVID-19. And uh, the other ones, P2Y12, uh, P2Y2, P2Y6, and P2X7, that are thought to be, to be mainly involved in the inflammation the tissue arm of uh, COVID-19. And therefore, we lead to endothelial cell activation, fibrous activation, and of course, immune cell activation. Both processes, this one and the other one on, on, the, on, the, on the top, will trigger an amplification loop uh, powered by further ATP, ADP release. So both processes will likely be started by ATP accumulation, but will cause additional ATP accumulation, thus generating an amplification loop. In this, uh, in this scenario, p 7 might have an important role. What might be the role of PTEC7 in this context? First of all, enhanced uh, angiotensin signaling, we know that is responsible for thromboinflammation, and this process is made through the generation of uh, activated factor 7, and this is very important, they proceed through the activation of tissue factor release, Enhancement of tissue factor expression on the cell surface, cell surface of macrophage, cell surface of the endo, endothelium, and many other cells. Uh, p 7 might have a role on this. If you, you look at this picture, you see a sequence of three pictures, D, E, and F, which are a uh, fluorescence picture cut through a single uh, dendritic cell, which was stained with anti-tissue factor antibodies. And you see that the antibodies nicely stain the surface of the dendritic cell. Then this cell was stimulated with BZATP and the, the stain disappeared. The stain disappears not because the cells were killed. If you look carefully enough, you still see the, sh the shade of the, of the cell but the stain disappears because these cells have re released tissue factor. To make a long, a long story short, this also is a very old paper, but uh, 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 while revisiting the role of P2X7 in COVID-19, by necessity, we had to go back to many observations sedimented in the past. To make this long story short, p 7 stimulation then triggers the release of tissue factor from human mononuclear phagocytes. And this, uh, starting from our initial study, was then confirmed in uh, several labs. Uh, and now it is uh, well known that uh, uh, mononuclear cell stimulation 
uh, via P2 excelling is a very strong stimulus for the release of tissue factor bearing microparticles. So possible therapeutic applications, maybe P2 excelling targeting might be useful to fight the thrombotic diathesis in COVID-19. Then, Thromboinflammation, endothelitis, endothelial cell activation, angiogenesis, lung edema are also supported by VEGF release. And incidentally, uh, not anymore, but at the very beginning, the VEGF pandemia, we were told that uh, uh, bevacizumab, avastin, which is an, an anti-VEGF antibody, might be a, a therapy. And in many uh, uh, clinics, uh, bevacizumab and uh, avastin were tested. Uh, nowadays, they are, uh, they are not uh, still a main indi indication for COVID-19, but still VGF has a very important role in lung edema angiogenesis during COVID and so on. So the basic observation from this Again, this is, this is also a very old picture, is that uh, p 2 promotes angio, uh, angiogenesis. These are uh, uh, specimens from two tumors. One is a, a tumor uh, made by hex cells, mock cells, mock hex cells on the left, and uh, hex cells transfected with p 2 cell. You can see that there are small vessels here in the tumor generated by a hex cells transfected with p 2 but not in the tumor generated by mock cells. And uh, on the bottom, this is a colon carcinoma tumor caused by CT26 colon carcinoma cells wild type with low expression of p 2 7 and uh, CT26 colon carcinoma cells transfected with p 2 And again, here you can see the small vessels. Therefore, p 2 expression promotes angiogenesis, and we can show that p 2 expression promotes VEGF release. VEGF release can be shown again in the tumor by VEGF staining, the tumor from hex cells with very low VEGF staining, the tumor from the transfected cells, very high VEGF stain. In vitro, in the uh, um, culture dish, the transfected cells in red express very uh, uh, high amount of VEGF, which, is, which can be further be stimulated, st stimulated by challenging with ATP. Therefore, p 7 triggers VEGF release. And this has been shown in a number of papers uh, in our and other and uh, other labs, and this is also now a fact that uh, p 7 triggers VEGF release. Therapeutic application, p 7 targeting might be good to fight thrombotic diathesis and neoangiogenesis in COVID-19. Well, then the famous uh, macrophage activation syndrome that everybody sees in uh, COVID-19. This macrophage activation syndrome is dependent on uh, NALP-free inflammasome activation, cytokine release, and is dependent on the famous cytokine storm. This cytokine storm leads to uh, this uh, acute respiratory dis distress syndrome that is a main cause of uh, uh, mortality in uh, COVID-19. What is uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and in the mouse, what is acute lung injury. ARDS is a syndrome of uh, acute onset of severe respiratory distress with cyanosis due to hypoxemia, which very important is refractory to oxygen therapy with diffuse abnormalities of chest uh, radiograph and decreased lung compliance. This syndrome can be induced by Many causes can be induced by viral infections, and in viral infections, p 7 blockade can prevent or reduce ARDS. As showed you before, this syndrome can be caused by LPS, 
and PTOC7 blockade is helpful to mitigate the effects of LPS uh, inhalation. And as uh, Robson showed some time ago, uh, also in uh, pulmonary infl uh, inflammation caused by silica, PTOC7 blockade uh, can mitigate the effects of uh, silica on, on the lungs. And since silica is very important for lung fibrosis, keep in mind again that lung fibrosis is very important in COVID. So therapeutic applications, PTOC7 targeting might be useful to fight, prevent, even prevent ARDS. Oh, then idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which mainly depends on the release of these cytokines, is uh, not so common during mild disease. In mild disease, only uh, maybe 4% develop fibrosis, but as the disease becomes more severe, the percentage, 24 and even 61% of uh, patients affected by COVID develops lung fibrosis. And about 25% of survivors have signs of restricted lung disease. This is very serious. So does PTOC7 has any place in fighting idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis? Possibly yes, because uh, as we showed before, there is this paper by Isabel Coulain showing that ATP is a danger signal during lung fibrosis, and also the paper by Robson showing that PTOC7 blockade uh, modulates fibrosis induced by uh, silica. Therefore, PTOC7 targeting might be useful to prevent lung fibrosis. So, another problem with uh, COVID-19 is uh, T lymphocyte exhaustion. T here is uh, highlighted in red. T lymphocyte exhaustion. During COVID, there is overactivation of T lymphocytes, which is followed sometimes very quickly by T lymphocyte exhaustion which causes inefficient virus clearance. This is due to many causes. There are many causes involved, many mechanisms responsible for T lymphocyte exhaustion, but one mechanism is mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, it is well known, as I said, that uh, there is a reduction in functionality of uh, T lymphocytes in COVID-19. Uh, Market T cell activation eventually leads to senescence, senescence and exhaustion, and so on, so on, so on. But what we also know is that uh, many T lymphocyte subtypes are heavily dependent on P2X7 receptor activity to modulate their energy metabolism. In other words, the mitochondrial energy metabolism in T cells is heavily dependent on P2X7 function. And uh, going back to a very old paper of ours, this may depend on the yin-yang effect that P2X7 stimulation has on the mitochondrial metabolism. Low level stimulation is good for mitochondrial metabolism. Overactivation of P2X7 causes a mitochondrial catastrophe. Well, possible therapeutic applications might be PTOX7 targeting to fight PTOX7 overstimulation and mitochondrial injury, and therefore prevent T lymphocyte exhaustion. But uh, you know for sure that coronavirus affects not just the lungs, but heart, brain, kidney, liver, any tissue in the body. COVID-19 might be a very serious cause of cardiac injury, myocarditis, pericarditis, it is uh, reckoned that about 20% of uh, COVID-19 patients in the, in the end are affected by some kind of uh, cardiac, uh, uh, cardiac defect. And this may be uh, due to a number of uh, causes, direct activation of the cardiac tissue. This might be to changes of uh, heart oxygenation due to the damage of the erythrocytes or to decreased oxygenation due to lung failure to the cytokine store. There are many, many 
many, many, many reasons why the heart might be affected in COVID-19, and it is increasingly becoming a, a, a focus of uh, attention by uh, clinicians these days. But also the, then the possible therapeutic applications may be pituitary targeting to fight or prevent cardiac injury. But also uh, neuro new, neurological complications are very important. Neurological complications may be due to hyperinflammation and cytokine storm. Every, um, any place for p 2 in uh, neurological complications, as Henning uh, uh, is teaching us, uh, hyperactivation of p 2 receptors might be very important in the neurological complications because hyperact now look at the uh, picture in the lower left. Over, uh, over, overactivation of p 2 on the astrocytes, on the microglia, might lead to overactivation of uh, uh, neural terminals, might lead to the generation of a number of toxin agents that might severely injure our brain. Incidentally, as Henning pointed out in this picture, it is anticipated that uh, in uh, COVID-19 there will be accumulation of ATP into the interstitial fluid into the brain, the red dots. Now, we can look at, at ATP into the brain. Now, let's uh, look at the picture on your right. These are mouse which were infected uh, as pups with an uh, adeno-associated virus bearing the Pimeluc construct, the construct, uh, the bioluminescent cost construct to measure ATP. So, and uh, these adenovirus were uh, specifically targeted to the neurons. Now, these mice, the very low uh, right picture, received an injury to the head. And you can see that the injury caused accumulation of extracellular ATP. Therefore, we can measure directly whether under the conditions hypothesized by Henning, there is indeed any ATP accumulation into the brain. Now, so possible therapeutic application, perfect targeting to fight or prevent lung and, um, okay, uh, I should, oh, sorry, I should delete lung and keep only neurological damage, sorry. Then, therapy, we are quickly going to the, to, to the end. On the basis of uh, the main uh, manifestations of uh, uh, COVID-19, hyperinflammation, thromboinflammation, cytokine storm, and on the basis of the possible involvement of PTX7, may we think of innovative therapy. Current therapy is mainly based on the antiviral remdesivir, on uh, uh, anti-inflammatory drugs such as dexamethasone, low molecular weight heparin, convalescent plasma, tocilizumab, anti-IL-6, anakirra, anti-1-beta, monoclonal antibodies that are free at the moment available, chloroquine, uh, azithromycin, vitamin D, vitamin C, and uh, but the, the main stem is no doubt heparin, especially as a supportive measure, uh, dexamethasone, and in the early phases, remdesivir. Can we think of a PTOC7 based therapy? There are several drug like uh, small molecules already tested in humans, there are the nanobodies, there are the antibodies. But I would like to draw your attention to another drug, colchicin. Colchicin is a very humble, is a very uh, inexpensive, but apparently very effective drug. There are, a, a, there are currently 27 trials listed on the clinical goal site that look at the effect of uh, colchicin in COVID patients. And in, at the beginning, oh, sorry, at the end of November, of this November, a huge trial start, was started uh, by the University of Oxford to specifically look at the role of colchicine 
in uh, COVID. And as you may remember, already Robson and his colleagues hypothesized that uh, colchicine might exert its uh, anti-inflammatory effect or one of the mechanisms involved in colchicine anti-inflammatory effect might be the inhibition of uh, P2X7 as summarized in this small graph on your left. Thus, a second and final issue is that uh, if we want to test uh, a drug, uh, an experimental drug, we must have a, a, a means to identify a marker of engagement. In other words, how can we check whether P2X7 receptor blockade is already in place to be sure that uh, what we see in the patients is really due to P2X7 receptor antagonism? How do we test the efficacy of the treatment? We might, for example, uh, measure P2X7 in circulation. We know that P2X7 is shed into circulation and might be used as a marker of inflammation. This is, uh, on your right, a correlation between uh, the C-reactive protein and uh, P2X7. And the, as you see, there is a fairly good correlation between the increase in C-reactive protein, which is a well-known inflammatory marker, and P2X7 into, into the blood. Therefore, if we wish to start a clinical study to test whether P2X7 is useful in COVID-19, we, uh, we also have a marker of engagement, which, which might be very important. Conclusions. Uncontrolled inflammation and dysregulation of the, of the coagulation pathway are main pathogenic factors of COVID-19. Excessive innate immune cell and unrestricted cytokine release are key features of hyperinflammation. The p 7 receptor is expressed at a high level by immune cells. p 7 stimulation causes NALP3 inflammasome activation, cytokine, TNF, and VGF release. Fibrosis is a frequent complication. p 7 receptor blockade prevents fibrosis in experimental models. Therefore, p 7 targeting might be an option in the therapy of COVID-19. Of course, it may seem that uh, P2X7 is a sort of panacea universalis, which is not the case, of course, but yet it might be worth to give it a try. So this is the end. Happy Christmas. Feliz Nadal from all us. Thank you. Francesco, thank you very much for this fantastic talk. Né? So putting together all aspects né, of um, P2X7 in COVID. So um, I think that uh, I, I learned a lot of I it. went uh, over the time. No, absolutely. You will never uh, go out of time because it was so fascinating and so interesting. Thank you very much. I would uh, like to invite the audience for uh, making questions. Francesco. Si. Can you see us? Si, si. Okay. Uh, I have two questions. Do you think that it's possible measure ATP concentration in the serum from, from the patient? Yes, I think so. But you must be very easier. quick. Yeah, yeah I know. And that, that, that's the problem. And the second one is, what do you think about P2Y12 in this context? This is very important. Um, I was reading a review by Paul Insel about the role of purinergic signaling in COVID. And he uh, heavily focused on P2Y12. Mm -hmm. uh, for the platelets, but also for the role that P2Y12 might have in the activation of dendritic, of dendritic cells. So he envisioned that uh, P2Y12 targeting might be another important uh, approach, which is very easy because, as you know, there are a number of uh, drugs. Mm -hmm. now. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, question. Maybe I can just make a question coming to that. No? Um, what about the P2Y 14 receptor? Because uh, so we are ready here to submit a paper that we will submit today. No? What is called no? P2Y 14 receptors a target for neutrophilia attenuation in severe COVID 19 cases from hematopoietic stem cell recruitment and chemotaxis to thromboinflammation. So, I mean, you, you make a very, you, you ask a very difficult question, which I cannot answer. But um, about a year ago, a very close friend of mine, who is a, a real clinician and who works uh, daily with patients, asked me whether I wanted to uh, start a study together with him about uh, to P2Y14 uh, uh, and the role of P2Y14 in uh, sepsis, mm -hmm. uh, which I did not, <laughs> because simply because I simply I couldn't. So I guess that uh, there are uh, good hints that it might be very important. Yes, because it is very much involved in neutrophilia. Yeah. It is involved in hematopoietic stem cell mobilization. Yes. Yeah. And I think yeah, so. It is very much uh, linked to trompe inflammation. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, but, so uh, I hope that the paper will. It's a hypothesis paper. Yes. Yeah. It is just to put out something yeah, which may arise new new research in, in COVID-19 research, yes? and Do you know if there are good reagents to study P2Y14? Yes, there are. If there are good reagents? Yes. If you my God got uh, reagents, uh, is from Kenneth Jacobson. Oh. So uh, he sent me, so I have a collaboration with him regarding this. So yeah. I did not do the experiment. And now also, because you know, in Brazil, all this is difficult. Now I have an antagonist, yes. And I have now also an antibody. Yeah. So, but we can, finally I can do some work here. That's very interesting. Yes, so just, uh, and also, yeah, so what is about, uh, so if you look at immune cells, yes. What is about hematopoiesis? Yes, if you look, to P2X7, yes, because then, so you may have an altered hematopoiesis also. Um, I don't know ex exactly what the role of P2X7 in the, in the in physiological hematopoiesis might be. Yes. Uh -huh. But in pathological uh -huh. hematopoiesis might be very relevant. There is a, a paper by I think by a Chinese group that just came out in the journal Clinical Investigation, yes. in which they uh, they show not very nicely, in my from my point of view, but uh, they show anyway that uh, in the hematopoietic niche in the bone marrow under pathological conditions there is a very high ATP concentration, extracellular ATP concentration that drives pathological, uh, sorry, pathological stem cell proliferation by acting at P2X7. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe under physiological conditions, the ATP concentration of course is lower, but still P2X7 might have a role in the hematopoietic niche. Mm -hmm. I think there are very few studies on this. Yeah, I understand. Mm -hmm. That's great, but I think so. But it's just so important that uh, that uh, that uh, pre-energy uh, signaling uh, becomes more and more important. <laughs> so I would like to to uh, to open my questions again, and I, I would also like mm -hmm. to encourage the students yes to.
Penny, well, I have a question. Yes, please. I also. Um, great, great uh, seminar presentation, Francesco. Um, I, um, considering that um, adenosine counteracts the effect of ATP, it is, is it possible to think that the transformation of ATP and adenosine is dysregulated in this pathology, in, this, in the cells, I don't know, the enzymes that transform ATP and adenosine are not uh, doing well their role. What do you think? It, yes, this is very, this is very reasonable. So it might be that uh, adenosine, uh, that there, there is not enough adenosine because the enzymes are uh, inhibited or down-regulated. Uh, but I'm, I'm not aware of any data. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it is clearly a, a, a very good possibility. There is not enough adenosine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions? Uh, Dejana, you had a question, was it like this? Yes, I would like to uh, make some questions. Thank you very much for the the, the talk, uh, Virgilio, it's a great pleasure to listen and more about that and uh, can discuss this topic. I would like to know if you are investigating uh, the role of P2X7 receptor in COVID-19, uh, maybe in patients or even in vitro, uh, are you carrying out some work in this field? At the moment, we are looking at uh, P2X7 in the blood of uh, COVID patients, trying to correlate the amount of uh, P2X7 in the blood to the severity of the disease. Ah, okay. Yeah. It, but, uh, okay. Uh, and... Uh, but uh, you are, and I don't know if can, I can ask uh, that, but uh, are you uh, also investigating if the antagonism of P2XM receptor maybe have some, um, uh, I don't know, in vitro maybe some uh, relevant effect in uh, which can be possible to correlate with COVID-19? Yes, I see your point, which is very important. But the answer is that at the moment, we have not yet started this experiment uh, for uh, two main reasons. One is that uh, um, we are bound to work with samples from the COVID patients in the hospital for uh, safety reasons, we cannot take the samples out of the hospital. And in, at this very moment, the hospital is very busy with uh, uh, curing the patients. <laughs> Therefore, there is not much time to carry on real experiments. And uh, the other uh, reason is uh, that um, uh, at the moment um, we have, th this is very practical, we have other experiments that need to be uh, finished, to be, uh, and, and we cannot start yet another project. This might seem stupid to you, but this is just practical reasons. Okay, thank you very much. Actually, it's a, a curiosity of mine, but I totally understand that we have a lot of to study and to investigate yet. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dejane. Questions? I have a question. Francesco, congratulazioni, un piacere averti qui con noi. I have a question. 
Uh, it's known that diabetes and hypertension is major risks for complication to, to pass to moderate for severe uh, steps. How could we relate this with the purinergic signaling? Um, P2X7 has been, has been involved in the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes because it sustains the systemic in, uh, inflammation, which is typical of uh, type 2 diabetes. Therefore, this might be a link between P2X7 and the increased risk uh, for COVID complications seen in diabetic patients. And the same might also be true for hypertension. There are uh, reports I think that there is at least one report that in hypertensive patients, there is an increased ATP concentration in the blood. So th they might already be uh, over the threshold for inflammation, for stimulation of inflammation by ATP, the hypertensive patients. Grazie. My interpretation. Yeah. yeah. Pause. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? If not, I have uh, Francesco, I have another question. So you talked about exhaustion of uh, T cells. Is it uh, uh, because of mitochondria? Is it like this, that uh, P2X7 receptor interacts with? Uh, has a function in mitochondria. No? I know that we discussed this sometimes, no? but the P2X7 receptor may be also in the mitochondria. No? And maybe you know, where exhortation comes, that you have alteration of mitochondrial function. Yes, and so that you don't have enough um, ATP production, ATP energy production. Is it like this? You might recall that uh, when I was at the last uh, purinergic meeting in uh -huh. uh, Brazil, I showed data about Peter 7 localization to the mitochondria. Exactly. Uh, this paper is not yet published because we had a lot of problems with the referees. It, it has been around now uh, for over a year. And uh, we had an incredible amount of problems with the with the referees. Uh, so, uh, and uh, but in this paper we show that indeed, PTX7 is in, on the uh, outer mitochondrial membrane, and that uh, uh, heavily control. ATP synthesis in the mitochondria and control the expression of uh, uh, mitochondrial respiratory complexes, especially complex one. And therefore, it is possible that uh, uh, P2X7 dysregulation will have very important, uh, will, will cause very important defects of mitochondrial metabolism. <clears throat> and um, uh, I did not show this data in Brazil because we collected this data later, but uh, um, in the P2X7 knockout mice, what we see is that there is a, a clear cut uh, a cardiac deficit. Mm -hmm. as measured uh, by uh, echocardiography in vivo mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the mice. Therefore, it seems that uh, this lack of uh, proper regulation of mitochondrial metabolism has diffuse consequences in, in uh, uh, mouse uh, physiology. <clears throat> and my point of view, it also has important effects on the metabolism of immune cells 
lymphocytes, macrophages, microglial cell, cells included. I, 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 I showed you the, uh, the paper by um, uh, Enric Borges da Silva, the nature paper on the T lymphocyte. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, now Enric Borges da Silva is in, uh, in, uh, in Denver, in Denver, Colorado. And he's setting up his own lab. And um, we are collaborating on a project to on a, over the Atlantic project <laughs> to, to see if we can uh, find a, a, a good mechanism explaining how p 2 x 7 has such a strong effect on the mitochondrial metabolism in immune cells. Yeah. It is somewhat, sometimes very difficult, but the scientific community um, accepts novel concepts. No? Yes, no. and I think this is a classical example of this. Yes. Mm. So I would like. To... Uh, Henny, Henny, Henny. Yes, Henny. Please, please. Uh, I would like to make a question, please. Yes, please, please do so. Uh, so, Virgilio, uh, Ana Ventura, de Virgilio, uh, very nice talk. Thank you very much. I was thinking if you have uh, in this passage from uh, a mild uh, COVID, COVID and uh, to a, a hard, uh, uh, severe form, if you have uh, any change in the mechanisms of ATP release, if you have multiple uh, mechanisms that ATP is released in uh, tissues, if you have a, a switch on these mechanisms, or or just a cell death, and uh, this is promoting the release of ATP. Uh, do, do you know the mechanisms involved, panexins, and all this? No, I don't know. I don't know, but I think that nobody knows at this stage. This is a very important question because maybe it could tell us what 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 is happening that uh, converts a mild disease into a very serious life threatening uh, threatening disease. Yeah. This switch might be very important, but uh, I have no information on this. Yeah, okay, nobody knows yet. This but, is clearly uh, open open to investigation. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Um, are there more questions? I have questions. Maybe the postdoc who was doing the P2Y14 paper with me, Livia, do you have a question? Hey. Hi, a very nice talk, uh, Virginia. Thank you very much. Uh, I actually got really uh, curious about the mitochondria part because I work also with that. So I actually have a question about that. So the um, the P2 uh, X7 uh, it's present on the mitochondria membrane. And uh, so there are a lot of other purinergic receptors in the mitochondria, or is this is just like a super new information about the purinergic signaling? This is a super new information. Uh, some time ago, we looked at the adenosine receptors in mitochondria, but uh, I cannot tell you the answer because this is a collaboration with, with another colleague of mine. So I cannot tell you whether there is or there is not. Ah, okay. No, but it's, it's super interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I Thank know you. that other people is looking at this. Uh, I, and um, for example, for some time also Pablo, Pablo Pellegrin has been mm -hmm. looking at the P2X7 in the mitochondria, and the, he also finds P2X7 in the mitochondria. But I but I have not seen the paper yet. Oh, great! I I will check for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Um, questions? Yeah, so maybe we're still in there. It, um, about ATP, yes, so, so the idea would be that you have an, that you have an, uh, an alpha permeability of ATP, uh, of a blood brain barrier, yes? So, mm -hmm. so that's the thing about the CNS, so it says you have an invasion no, of, um, of immune cells, maybe even lymphocytes and macrophages, yes, yeah, yeah. and they express p 2 x receptors, no? and they may release ATP, yes? Yes. No? But this leakage of the blood-brain barrier no? would also allow the direct inflow of ATP. You mean inflow, inflow into the brain? Yes. Mm -hmm. Through the blood. Mm -hmm. Yes. Where? Where from? So if you uh, if you think you you have basically you, know, you, you have a connection of um, of of um, you have a direct connection uh, of the blood vessels to the brain, yes? No? Yes. So then you could also say that connecting tissues could leak ATP into the brain. Yes, but the but but who who. Uh, releases the ATP that goes into the brain. Which cells? Probably uh, blood cells, the macrophages, for example. Maybe even uh, uh, erythrocytes. Maybe. Yes. Maybe, but just looking for immune cells, yes? Yeah. 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 Yes. Because what is where uh, so you have a local release now of cells that come in now, you may have, have a, a general leakage into the brain hmm. of what but you know that now we can measure this hmm. now we can measure this with uh, adeno associated viruses uh, with the pimenu construct, we can directly measure if the brain undergoes a local or diffuse ATP increase. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But I think it's an important yeah. point, yes? No? To get some better idea on this, yes? Mm -hmm. I agree, yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, questions from the audience? Yeah, I'd like to ask something. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, professor professor hello. Eric, hello? Hello, hello? Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, professor Eric to told you about the, asked you about the, the blood brain barrier. I would like to ask about the olfactory nerve, if there is there is a um, kind of affinity for the the virus to yes. infect also the the cells of the of the nerve. So, yes. do you? I would like to know if you, if you can talk something about that. <laughs> this is a very difficult question. I'm I'm <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I'm not a neurologist. I I. I know very little of this. I think that Professor Henning Ulrich is much, much, much more competent than me. <laughs> yes, but also I'm, about I'm sorry, Luciana. No, what is known, but uh, but there is an okay, affinity okay. of, of uh, by entry uh, by entry receptors no? to uh, to neural yeah. cells, even to undifferentiated cells. Yes, no, no. Yeah. And while factory yeah. neurons, uh, we have all the time. They have, they are getting renewed from progenitor cells, yes? No? So that maybe yes. also that you import the virus from these progenitor cells all the time, yes? Yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah? Because you have a flow of the cells to the, to the olfactory bulb, yes? Yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah. 
maybe have a direct mm -hmm. infection there, but you may have also by the flux of the cells, you may have an infection overall at, at many places. Yeah, but maybe this is a um, way to enter the nervous system more Absolute, than the absolutely. blood that is brain the, barrier. Yeah. Yeah, but yes. it's also yeah, yes, this is an entry system to the to the CNS, yes, no? Yes, absolutely. I agree. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> mm -hmm. uh, more questions? If not, I would like to thank very much no, Professor mm -hmm. Francesco Di Virgilio for this to honor us with this fantastic closing lecture, yes, of um, of the seminar series of the Brazilian Brewing Club. Yes? And the seminar series of the Brazilian Brewing Club is, uh, I think it was also a fantastic idea, yes, and to yes. see what we can do in, uh, by this virtual events. No? We don't come together in person, yes, but we had for a long time, we had, uh, we had presentations, we had students' presentations, we had postdoc presentations, yes, and I think this has um, brought the Brewing Club even more together and, 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 much, and, and interested uh, uh, people to join, also to join the, the seminars, yes? Uh, and independently you know, from now doing again the presential meeting, yes? I think it is, uh, would be great to go on with that because it's so easy to organize, yes? And it's so easy to join, yes? Just a Friday afternoon, such a it's like a, a Brazil or worldwide seminar series, no? Mm -hmm. On on a, on on a very specific topic no? that all of us interests. And so, uh, and I, yes, now, yes. I, I would like to thank you again, Doctor Francesco, our. Virgilio, our friend, and um, now, today uh, it is the last seminar of 2020 of the Brazilian Purine Club, and um, it was a terrible year, and uh, these seminars uh, join the people of Brazilian people around the pure energetic signaling. It's, it was amazing, it was great. Uh, so I would like to thank everyone who uh, participated in these seminars and uh, especially the speakers. Uh, the majority of the speakers who, who, who was uh, postdocs, uh, young scientists that we invited to speak here to us. And uh, I would like to thank to these young scientists and then other scientists that we invited. And uh, to finish this year with uh, your presentation, it's uh, amazing for us. It's very, very good for us to see you again, even virtually. Uh, so uh, to finish this, this, this seminar, I would like to say that the Brazilian Purine Club wish to all a Merry Christmas and uh, a better New Year. It's a lot of good news because 2020 is finishing, <laughs> but the uh, the coronavirus not. So we we have to continue strong uh, and uh, take care uh, of us. Thank you very much, Francesco. Thanks a lot. Thanks Thank a lot you, to everybody. Annie. Thank you, thank you very much. I would also like to thank Anna Barascini, Alessandra, Jose, and Claudiana Lamio for organizing this. Because I was today here the chairman, but so the other series were, were by, basically organized by, by other members of the Brewing Club. Thank you very much. Yes. Grazie. Grazie yeah. ancora a tutti. E buon yes. Natale. <laughs> buon Natale. Yeah. All the best for you, Virginia. And all the best for everybody. Yeah? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.
<laughs> we are very proud of your friend, friendship. No? no, I'm I'm very proud of your friendship. Me too. Very well. Ciao. 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 See you the next year. Ciao. Take care. Ciao. 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 Ciao.